Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. All right. Um, so it's my pleasure to welcome Siba ready to um, you know, hear and to give us a talk. Um, so Siva is currently a PhD student at um, Edinburgh, uh, working with Marila Lapata and uh, Mark Steeman. Um, and then I think you are graduating soon, right? Yeah, okay. yeah, early next year. Early next year, OK. And then um, so Siva has a, a very diversified interest in uh, NLP field, and including information interaction, um, uh, distributed um, uh, semantics and also uh, more recently semantic parsing and uh, he has won a base paper award in IJC, uh, IJC NLP yeah. and also um, you know, win some competitions in semi level tasks um, and I think today he's going to talk about his recent work on semantic parsing. Thank you. Um, so hello all, I am from University of Edinburgh and I brought uh, everybody some sweets. So in the first <laughs> row, <laughs> whoever is watching this on streaming, you're missing those sweets. So <laughs> you better come here. <laughs> um, uh, thanks, Scott, uh, for for the for invitation, and it's a privilege to be here. So th today I'll talk about my PhD work on creating a typed semantic interface for dependencies. So I titled this as uh, Towards a Compositional Type Semantics for Universal Dependencies. This is a joint work with my supervisors, uh, Merla Lapata and Mark Stittman, and my Google collaborators. Uh, you see all of them here. And they funded my, my PhD and have been uh, collaborating since then. OK. So if you see this sentence in my, this is, this is a sentence in my native tongue, which is Telugu. So you could read this as I also provided the gloss. So monkey, banana, eat. So as soon as you see the gloss in your brain, something like this pops up, right? If I give you a dependency tree, which says here monkey is the object and uh, banana is the subject, suddenly this images, image changes to something like this because banana is eating the monkey from the dependency. You could see it from the dependency tree. You did not know anything about the morphology of my language. You did not know the word order, anything. All I did was provided you a dependency tree and then you could infer the semantics. So. Dependency trees help semantics. In the case of computers, if you provide this dependency tree, you don't have to do anything much more additional than giving the dependency tree. You, uh, it's, you could infer some semantics that's better than without providing it. Okay. So coming to universal dependencies, universal dependencies is a schema for annotating dependency trees. So here, in this sentence, Disney acquired Pixar in 2006. So Disney is the subject of acquired. Pixar is the object. And the proportional attachment is 2006 here. And if you take this same sentence in my native tongue, which is Telugu, you could reorder those words. And uh, you could get a sentence like, Pixar ni Disney rendevel or lo kunindi. So this. Uh, this is a valid sentence in my mother tongue. And if you see the dependency tree, it looks exactly similar. So here, again, you see that Pixar is the object, Disney is the subject, and you could see some reordering in the proportional attachment. So we, we don't have prepositions, we, we have postpositions. So all of this, you could see, even though the word order changed, even though the morphology is different, you still ended up with the same dependency tree. Okay. So the very cool thing about dependency, universal dependency is it provides a 
homogeneous syntactic representation across languages. And it has three banks in 40 languages and more coming. So right now it's 48. And all you need is just an hour to understand these dependency labels. And you could start annotating yourself. Cool. So even though those are the cool facts about dependency tree, but something is mi missing in dependency trees that is uh, very important. So we do not have a theory of semantics for dependencies. So given a dependency tree, so dependency tree is a syntactic tree. But if you want to extract semantics from dependency trees, there is no theory of semantics for dependency trees. So this talk is about making dependency trees transparent to semantics. So providing a semantic interface for dependency trees. Okay. So let's uh, take some motivation from uh, linguistics. So uh, so principle of compositionality says that the semantics of a complex expression is determined by the semantics of its constituent expressions and the rules used to combine them. So here our complex expression is the dependency tree. And the constituent expressions are the subtrees in the dependency tree. And the rules that are used to combine them are the dependency labels. Okay. And let's also see what uh, other formalisms are doing. So if you take so these are the existing syntax semantics interface. So if you have a syntactic derivation in any of these formalisms you could extract semantics from the syntax itself. So here I have combinatory categorical grammar, which my supervisor works a lot. And he invented uh, this formalism. And uh, the other formalisms like HPSG, LFG, TAG, you could use any of these fa favorite formalisms, and you can get syntax and semantics at the same time. And particularly, I'm uh, I work most on CCG, and some, let's take some inspiration on what CCG is doing here. So if you take the sentence, Disney acquired Pixar, if you see the syntactic type of acquired here, what this is saying is uh, acquired requires an NP on, my right hand, on its right-hand side and an NP on its left-hand side to become a sentence. Okay, and Using this syntactic type, you could also write a, uh, a semantic function that describes the predicate argument structure of acquired here. So before I explain what this is doing, this is just very quick intro to lambda calculus so that everybody follows. So if you, the whole lambda calculus is based on this single formula, lambda x m when applied to n is x substituted with n. Okay. So if you, you could say sum of uh, 2 and 3 can be written as lambda x, lambda y, plus of x, y. And this, uh, if you apply this function to 2 and 3, in the first uh, step, you s substitute x with 2, and this becomes uh, plus 2y, and you get rid of x. In the next step, you substitute y with 3, and you get rid of y. So it becomes plus 2, 3, and then in the end, you, you end up with 5. And you could also say the type of this function sum is it takes an integer, it takes another integer, becomes an integer. And you could also do recursive function. Once you define a function, you could do recursive uh, function. You could define recursive functions as long as uh, the types match. Okay. So let's come back here. So here, this function says lambda y, which represents this NP here. Lambda x is this NP here, and uh, it returns an event. So what this predicate argument structure is, there is an e uh, event, event called uh, acquired. And one of the participants is this x, which is uh, uh, arg1. And the other participant is y, which is arg2. And I don't know what x and y are at this point. But when you do the composition, so this NP, this function gets this NP, 
So you get rid of that NP. On the semantic side, you substitute Y with Pixar. And suddenly, acquired Pixar gets this, uh, acquired, this e event gets access to Pixar. So one of the participants in this event is Pixar. And similarly, as you go along, you get the complete logical uh, form for the whole sentence. So given a syntactic derivation, I was able to get the semantic uh, uh, form of this tree. We, here I'm using logical forms. In what sense is this semantic? I mean, why are you saying that this is semantic and not simply another way of looking at the syntax? What semantics have you added by doing this? Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's a very good question. So here, by semantics, I mean just the predicate uh, argument structure. So I'm in this in this simple sentence, like uh, it, you you see, it's almost uh, very similar to the syntactic structure. But when you have complex uh, um, uh, sentences which has relative clauses and other things, it's not very straightforward from the syntax what the arguments of each of the uh, verbs, or what are the events, or what are the participants in the events. Uh, my hope is that even though the semantics is a bit toy semantics, it could help uh, in some applications. I will also show you some uh, application where I use this is uh, semantics. So you, you could say that, why don't we use directly the syntax and not this kind of uh, it's not very informative right, as right. a semantic representation. Right. Um, I, to me, that doesn't really represent semantics yet. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, that, that's very true. So this is just like for convenient purposes, I would say. Uh, more, more abstract representation of uh, language than in its original form. So what CCG was doing is it is providing a typing mechanism using these types, syntactic types. And it also provides these combinator rules. So it's saying here, this is a forward composition, which, uh, which takes an argument. So you have these combinator rules, which allows synchronous syntax and semantics interface. Uh, you could say, like, why don't we just use CCG and not dependencies? Uh, as we said, as I said earlier, dependencies are easy to annotate, whereas in currently like CCG banks, it's hard to annotate. And also, there are not many tree banks for CCG yet. And in dependencies, there's a lot of work currently that's going on to build highly accurate parsers. So we could use those parsers. Uh, to do dependency parsing. And also, the important thing is that these are friendly to read. You could just spend a few minutes to understand these trees. Okay. So he, in this talk, uh, I'm, I outlined my, uh, the whole flow as follows. Like I present uh, how to convert dependencies to logical forms and then and use those logical forms for free-based semantic parsing. And the good thing is, since I use dependency trees, I could also work with multiple languages at the same time. Okay. So coming to dependencies to logical forms. So uh, this is uh, to Lucy's point as well. Like, why do we need these logical forms? These are just another representation. It may not be semantics, but people showed that these are very useful for semantic parsing and for many other tasks. So I'm calling this uh, a semantic representation, but uh, it need not be a semantic representation, just one convenient representation. Okay. So let's take this sentence. Uh, Pixar is a company located in California. So you see the dependency tree that Pixar is the subject uh, for this Coppola is company. And uh, you, you also have a relative clause here. Uh, this is a reduced relative here. And if you ask a question like, what is located in California? If you, 
you would say Pixar is located in California. And this is not directly present in the dependency tree. So if you see, there is no arc between Pixar and located. So you have two arc. You, you have to go through company to get located. Whereas in predicate argument structures, uh, I use the logical forms. You have directly an argument from located to Pixar. So here, what we are saying is, there is an event called lo located, and Pixar is one of the participants in this event. So the event is called uh, ZE, and the uh, and Pixar is XA, and XA is a participant in this event located. And we're also saying that Pixar is a company, and Pixar is located. Uh, uh, it's California is one of the participants in this event. Uh, so here, California is YA, and YA is participating in ZD with this predicate organ. Okay. Cool. Uh, the, the one of the main goals of this work is to derive these logical forms in a compositional fashion. So by this I mean, given this tree, so first uh, I take this part and then get its semantics, which is uh, lambda x California of xa. So from in California, we go to its logical form. Once we get in California's logical form, we can compute the logical form for located in California. And once we get located in California, we could do company located in California. So in the end, until we get the final logical form for the whole sentence. So we're doing this in a compositional way. OK, let's uh, see how to work this out. So the goal, let's start very with a very simple sentence, Disney acquired Pixar. And we want this final logical form where ZE is uh, the acquisition event and uh, Pixar is participant a Disney is participant in this event. So, yeah. uh, so how do we do this is we, we treat dependency labels as the one that drive the composition. This is very different from existing formalisms. So in all the existing formalisms, words are the one that drive the composition, whereas here the dependency labels drive the composition. So you take a dependency tree from the root node, and then based on the obliqueness theory in linguistics, which says process object first, and then other arguments, and then subject. So based on this obliqueness theory, we say, OK, given this tree, first I will compute the semantics of acquired Pixar. And as I told you, that dependency labels are the ones that drive the composition. So dobj takes the semantics of acquired, it takes the semantics of Pixar, glues them together to get the semantics of acquired Pixar. So this is the one that drives the composition. Once uh, we do the composition, we get the semantics of acquired Pixar, and then again follow this obliqueness hierarchy to get the semantics of uh, Disney acquired Pixar. So this n subject knows what to do with the semantics of acquired Pixar and Disney to get the semantics of this whole sentence. So now we know how to traverse the tree and the order of composition, but we still don't know how we got this logical form from uh, the composition. So we need to define a lambda calculus that would derive this logical form from this order of composition. So we use three basic types, like uh, every other uh, lambda calculus uh, formalism for predicate argument structures. So here we have individuals which are represented by subscript A. So these represent the entities in our world. Events which, in which these individuals participate, and truth values of the logical expressions. For, for that, we use bool. Okay. Uh, so the semantics of words compared to other formalisms is much simpler. So here, 
we define the semantics of acquired as that there is some x, x is an event, and that event is an acquisition event. So this function is providing access to this acquisition event. So as you see, like this is very, uh, very simplified semantics compared to the CCG semantics which we saw earlier, where uh, lexical words have all the semantics encoded in it. Whereas here, we are not saying anything about the argument structure. All we are just saying is that acquired is an event. That's all. And for Pixar, we are saying Pixar is an individual. And we are getting access to that individual using this uh, variable x. Okay. How, how do you decide whether one is then the other is argumented based on the, whether it's the, the part of speech? Uh, yeah, mainly based on part of speech. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, in some cases, we have some words acting as both events and also individuals. Uh, so it seems like um, in conventional CCG, something about the subcategorization frame of the word is encoded in the lexical entry, mm -hmm. right? So if I have like the window broke versus John broke the window, yeah. um, the, the indication that the sort of syntactic subject corresponds to different thematic roles of the predicate argument structure is present in that lexical entry. Right, it seems right. like that's sort of missing now, right? The, uh, that is missing here. That's true. Uh, it, so, and so the ambiguity is now placed on something about the interpretation of those um, syntactic dependencies as they're converted into the semantic Exactly, yeah. So the dependency label... It does seem like each of the, the dependencies are consumed serially as opposed to consumed as a joint, right? So it's right, right. difficult to encode this sort of subcategorization frame information. Is that right? Or uh, That's right. So dependency parser itself is giving some kind of predicate argument structure. So it's doing all the work we need already. So. But it does seem like you're consuming each of those dependency arcs independently, where this sort of the window broke versus John broke the window. Mm -hmm. In each case, the thing that was broken was the window, but the syntactic dependency was was different, right? Right, in, right. In the window broke, it's the subject, and in John broke the window, it's the object. Um, and so I'm just wondering how how you sort of capture that information. If you if you if you look at the full constellation of dependency mm -hmm. labels, it seems like you could recover that. But if you're consuming each dependency label independently, it seems like this is a difficult thing to encode, right? Right, right. It's, it it is difficult to encode here. So the goal is to get to some uh, abstract uh, semantic representation, but then based on the task, we need to do those uh, more those distinctions um, and for for the kind of things you said we need even higher order logic so so here I'm using very simple semantics but in some cases we may have to push those predicate argument structure at the lexical level so this is one scenario where we actually have to push things at the lexical level uh, but at least in this work we did not uh, push anything onto the lexic lexical level. We pushed everything to the dependency labels. So, and uh, we treat them independently. Uh, one good thing about the dependency schemes are that they have two different labels for passive constructions and uh, like active constructions. So in the, in the case of John broke the window, John gets the subject. Uh, whereas uh, in the window is broken, window would be the end subject pass. The That's not a passive constructed construction. Oh, okay, okay. So yeah, you're right. In in some cases, some that, cases, it, yeah, yeah, that's true. you've been saved by the the encoding of the syntactic dependencies and universal dependency yeah, schema. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, but in other cases, it, the lexicon is what makes the difference between the interpretation, right? That's in that's, very, that's very true. Yeah. So in 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 the paper, we actually uh, point this limitation of our framework. Thank you. Okay. So once we got the lexical semantics, now dependency labels are the ones that drive the composition. So they take the semantics. So if you see here, this dependency label D obj is taking two arguments and returning uh, one in variable here. So F represents the acquired event. So here, Z is binding to the event variable of acquired. And now you got access to the event variable. 
So here I'm binding x to the individual variable of Pixar. I get access to Pixar. And then I can say my predicate argument structure is in this event ZD, arg2 of ZD is, X, is XA, which is Pixar. Once I consume F and G, I return the access to the event variable because I need it for further composition. Okay. So now we know what are the lambda calculus functions for dependency labels here and uh, for the words. And all we have to do is the composition. So in the first step, we substitute f with uh, this uh, function here, lambda z equal z d, and get rid of, of f. And suddenly, this expression got access to acquired uh, event. And also, uh, we, we still did not get access to y. We don't know what this y is here. But g provides access to y. So in the next step, we substitute g with uh, lambda by Pixar and then get access. So now we got the semantics of acquired Pixar. And similarly, we, n sub has a, a lambda calculus function. And then it gets access. And in the end, we could uh, get the semantics of the whole sentence. OK. Yeah, this is how we end up. And let's look into a few more dependency labels. Like So one example here is appositives. So Disney, the company, which is Disney is a company. So here, the individual variable of Disney and the individual variable of company refer to the same individual. That's that. So we take f, which is Disney, g, which is company, and say these refer to the same individuals, f of x and g of x. And then we return the access to that individual. Who Similarly, we, we defined uh, uh, lambda calculus functions for other dependency labels. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to details. Maybe we could go to those details in the end. So for part mode, for conjunctions. OK. I'm sorry, can you go oh. back just like one more slide? I think I, one more. Oh, more, yeah. I didn't understand the lambda z. Right. Uh, what is the z? There's no z in the expression. Uh, so here, uh, oh. OK, so what we did is we took a dependency tree, defined it on uh, order in which we traverse the tree, defined the composition order, assign lambda calculus functions to each of the nodes in the dependency tree, and then we do the composition to get the final logical form. Okay. So in a nutshell, dependency tree is a series of compositions. and Dependency labels are the ones that drive the composition. Each dependency label takes two typed semantic expressions and returns a typed semantic expression. Okay. So now we have these logical forms. Let's do a task using those logical forms. And uh, the task I'm doing here is freebase semantic parsing. So as you all know, freebase is a, uh, is a knowledge base which has entities and the relation uh, relations between entries. So here, Titanic, and the director of Titanic is James Cameron, and the actors in Titanic are DiCaprio and other things. And given a question like, who is the director of Titanic, your goal is to answer the question here uh, as James Cameron. And the way people do this is that uh, we assume that there is some latent logical form which, ended, which gives us this answer. So. If you execute this latent logical form, you get this answer on uh, freebase. Okay. And if you see existing approaches for semantic parsing, most people treat this as end-to-end uh, -end semantic parsing. So here, who is the director of Titanic? And you're given this logical form. Your goal is to learn a grammar that can derive this logical form from, uh, from the grammar. So here, you have word director. So I'm using CCG grammar here. So the word director in natural language means film.director in freebase. And it is of type noun. And the word of has this uh, uh, syntactic type as back np, forward np, sorry, np, forward np, back np, forward np. And it also has this uh, predicate argument structure 
that could help us in deriving this logical form here when we do the composition. So this is uh, like end-to-end -end semantic parsing, directly going from the words to the target representation. The other popular thing which we do here is take the question, convert the question to some kind of logical form, like dependencies to logical form or, or CCGs to logical form. Use this logical form to go to the target logical form. I call this grounded logical form because these predicates are grounded in Freebase. Whereas here, the predicates are still in the natural language, so I call it ungrounded logical form. Okay. So we are taking this approach. So the setting is you have training data which has question and answer pairs, and your evaluation task is uh, question answering on Freebase. So the re resources we have uh, are a dependency parser and a way to convert dependency parsers to logical forms. And the hypothesis is that these logical forms are more useful than the syntactic trees in, them, in themselves. Okay. So in, in Freebase, you have these entities represented here in rectangles, and you have facts represented as edges between rectangles. So here, there is a fact queue saying that Barack Obama is a, president, uh, is a US uh, citizen. And Freebase also has these complex facts represented uh, by clicks. So here, Barack Obama uh, did his bachelor's in Columbia University. So this whole thing is representing one single fact. Okay. So our approach to semantic parsing is given some sentences, like in this case, questions, we parse our, uh, the using differentiate parser. You don't have to read things that are inside the box. So yes. So take uh, dependency parse, and using dependency to lambda, uh, we convert that to a logical form. Once we have the logical form, we know that free base is a graph, right? So we convert this logical form to a graph-like structure. So here I uh, have a graph. And our goal is to convert the natural language graph to free base graph. So we need to find the best match that corresponds to this natural language graph in Freebase. And once we have the natural language graph and the, the Freebase graph pairs, we can learn a model. And uh, given a new question, we can answer it using this model. Okay. So in the previous part, I discussed how to convert sentences to logical forms. And I do some pre-processing, get rid of uh, most variables so here, and uh, have better predicates. So here, for this uh, sentence, I have this final logical form. And I take the entities in this logical form and make them nodes in the, in the graph. Take the e events in this logical form and make uh, them as edges. So here, I have one event in which all these three things are participating. I take those predicates and make them uh, the edge labels. So I have I created a natural language graph now. And if you see this natural language graph in Freebase, it almost looks similar, but there are a few things that are different. So the entities in this graph are in the natural language world, whereas the entities in Freebase, they have different uh, strings. So here I have lowercase Cameron. Uh, here I have uppercase Cameron to say that these are two different strings. And the strings, even the edge labels are different. So here I have directed dot in whereas here I have some complex. So the strings are different. Uh, and one interesting thing is, in the, in the natural language, we are saying that uh, Cameron directed Titanic corresponds to one single event, whereas Freebase is saying they are represented by two different events. One, one of them is Cameron directed Titanic, and Titanic is released in 1997. So these are two different events. And it also says that the edge between Cameron and 1997 is not interesting. So it doesn't uh, have an edge between them. So our goal is to, given this kind of uh, natural language graphs, to convert them to Freebase graphs. So we could do some kind of graph matching to find the set of possible Freebase graphs and pick one of those graphs as our target graph. Okay. So one question you could ask is, sometimes the natural language graph we produce would not correspond to the structure uh, of Freebase. So here, if you take what is the name of the director of Titanic, so you are interested in this variable x. x is the name of y, and y is the director of Titanic. Whereas Freebase is directly saying that 
X directed Titanic. So there are two edges in between what we are interested in and the, uh, and the entity, uh, but there is only one edge in free base. So th there's this extra edge. So one way to address this problem is paraphrasing. So given uh, this sentence, I paraphrase it as who is the director of Titanic, uh, who, who directed Titanic, and then that graph matches this. But the approach we are taking here today is uh, graph transduction. By this I mean I can contract that edge and make it look like a free base. So given a natural language graph, I transform the graph uh, like using graph contractions and expand and try to find the graphs that it matches in the free base. Okay. Uh, so now we know how to convert natural language graphs to free base graphs, but the problem is one graph in natural language can map to multiple graphs in Freebase. Which of these is the correct graph? We do not know. So for this, we learn a model which ranks all the graphs. So our model uh, takes, our model is a structured perceptron, which takes a, a grounded graph, ungrounded graph, and the question as in, uh, and extract some features out of those, and uh, there is, a weight vector which ranks how important is a feature, and based on that, uh, we can know how how likely is that for our given sentence, uh, how likely is the free base graph. And for training, we use uh, perceptron update, where we have a goal graph, and an um, b which needs a goal graph to update. So if our prediction is wrong, we update uh, the weight vector. But the problem here is that we do not have access to goal graphs, because we, all we have is just access to questions and answers. So to get access to a goal graph, what we do is we, we get all possible free base graph matchings, execute all those graphs to get some answers, and pick the graph that has the highest denotation match as a surrogate goal graph. And we, if there are multiple graph matches, we pick one of those graphs using our current model. So all I'm trying to do is, given a natural language graph, what is the best possible free base match uh, that has the least, uh, that has the hi uh, high highest denotation match? Yeah. So even ignoring that you don't, like even suppose you have a goal graph. Yeah. Right? yeah. So the potential way to convert a grounded graph to the goal graph, there could be many, many ways, right? Given right, that right, you right. can do a contraction and, and skipping edges or something. So how do you deal with that? Uh, so we have all, all the features uh, defined on that. So we, pe we penalize uh, graph contractions and expansions. So we try to minimize those. So this weight factor penalizes whenever we, we explore all the possible ways. And then the weight factor says, do not explore that possibility. We also have a beam search. So, so you use beam search? Beam search, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, so in our setup, uh, to convert dependency trees to logical forms, we use 69 lambda calculus formulae. And we use web questions uh, data set, which is real Google search engine queries. And that's translated to German and Spanish. And for dependency parser, we use a, a bidirectional LSTM parser. So currently, the numbers uh, on dependency parsing look as follows. Okay. So for baselines, we use a simple graph, which is bag of words baseline. These do not use any syntax. All we are trying to do is the predict a goal graph just based on the words in the sentence and not the structure. Uh, and the other thing you could ask is why not directly use a dependency tree to do the graph transduction and not going through logical forms. So we also directly transduce a dependency tree to the target graph. Okay. So when we see the results, the bag of words baseline is able to answer around 48 questions out of 100. If we directly use the dependency tree, we get a bit more. But when we use our logical forms, we get even better. So we get few points improvement. And this pattern is observed in German and also in Spanish. So we could see that 
our logical forms are useful for this task. Matching and matching against the snippets in Google, for example. Uh, matching it. Just mm -hmm. no linguistic processing, just a comparison yeah, so to this, Google keyword. So this is like simple I mean, graph, but I'll just keyword. Oh, this keyword, no. Like if you who directed Titanic, the camera is likely to be in the top snippet right there. And if you just look across oh, okay, the okay. snippet's yeah. camera, it will probably pop up many times. So just some simple heuristic like that. Okay, okay. I would expect oh. to do very well on this task. I'm just asking, how much is the machinery buying you in this task uh -huh. versus um, an existing web scale infrastructure? At least for this data set, I would assume that it buys it, like, if you use Google uh, snippets, it would answer a lot of these questions because these are frequently asked questions and these are all, almost uh, present somewhere on the internet. So you, you, the, the accuracy would be pretty high. My guess would be, yeah. Nobody has done that, yeah. Yeah, why not? That seems like the sort of obvious baseline for this kind of work. Yeah. yeah. And it, it seems like it's not included in so, the papers I've seen. In yeah, yeah. Curated. Main reason could be like we're trying to use the knowledge graph. The other, when. For why? For the sake of using the knowledge graph or for the task itself? I mean, it sort of comes down to that. Yeah, for, for the sake of using knowledge graph, I would say. like. I vaguely remember I did something like that, but I'm not sure it's, I did it rigorously. Well, I'm asking because we tried this yeah, kind of I know. and we did compare that baseline. Already, it was kind of depressing. <laughs> I already remember <laughs> that a time I did uh, to, to check whether Bing actually directly returns the answer. Yeah. So, But it's not a snippet. It's actually sometimes they already file the pattern. And then for that, it's about 20% F1 coverage. Um, we did try our implementation of the SMSR, but I didn't actually run right, it. Right, SMSR is... Yeah, I didn't run on all the questions, but just tried a few, and then it was not so good, so I, I didn't actually cut that experiment. I think another argument for doing this is, does you want to develop techniques that would work on knowledge bases that aren't really popularly written facts? Yeah, but yeah. another tricky part in terms of that kind of invariation is that sometimes you get it right, but you don't have the exact stream matching thing because you know you have the aliases. Instead, you don't have the connector thing. Or so, or so uh, no, I mean maybe for example the director name said you only get the last name instead of the full name, but you know that you got the answer. This, but it, it makes the invariation thing very annoying. One motivation for me to use knowledge graph or anything is like compositionality. Uh, like you can really form complex questions and answer it on knowledge graph because they won't be found in the text. Uh, whereas these data sets do not have compositional questions. That's the sad part. Okay. Uh, just to compare with the previous approaches. So, so this is, I'll just keep, so. If we, if we use Stanford dependencies, so our numbers are lower than the bag of words baseline. Okay. And if you use our representation, you get a bit higher. The reason why this is performing lower than bag of words is that Stanford dependencies have, uh, do not make head words as the, do not form the pre, uh, dependency relations between the head words. Sometimes with proportional attachment, you have to go to the proportion and then to the uh, to the noun in the proportion, whereas universal dependencies addressed all those problems. So in the universal dependencies case, it was performing better than the bag of words baseline. Okay. Uh, uh, other interesting thing is like when we use CCG logical forms, we are not buying as much like we. This is the bag of words, just point one. Uh, the reason was like we found that CCG is pretty sensitive to word order changes or ungrammatical challenges. So if you have what Nestle owns, CCG has difficulty because the original question would what does Nestle own or what owns Nestle or it could. So the word order change. So and since these are real Google search engine queries, sometimes we even even the dependency lambda fails for some channel. So this is a pretty bad grammatical sentence. Okay. So just to make sure, like you already saw, 
what CG, CCG has been doing. So the main differences between CCG and our formalism are, is like we have very simple lexical semantics compared to CCG semantics. And in our case, uh, dependencies are the ones that drive the composition, whereas in CCG, words are the ones that drive the composition. And one attractive property which I see using dependencies to Lambda is we're trying to get to universal, mostly universal types. So dobj in all languages could only mean these possibilities, or nsubj could mean only these possibilities, ACL. Whereas in CCG, because this is a lexicalized formalism, if the word order changes, you tend to have different uh, uh, lexical categories, and also you try to do morphology, other things in the lexical, in the word level itself. Whereas we don't have to deal with all that problems. Uh, other cool things are like in C C C with CCG, people showed that you could do really uh, fancy typed semantics, like. So you could also do distributional semantics using CCG syntactic types. We could do all those uh, fancy things with our framework because ours is also a typed uh, semantic uh, framework. So, so presently, I showed uh, one possibility using Lambda calculus. But uh, what we are currently doing is we are going through richer composition functions. So we are trying to use neural networks instead of the instead of uh, uh, first order like lambda calculus functions. And also, we are also trying to derive dependency trees at the same time when we do some semantic parsing tasks. So both, so pipeline versus synchronous syntax semantics interface. Um, so here, I'd not go into much uh, details about the type system, but our type system for this work is pretty simple. Uh, but we, in the in the current work we, we are doing, we want to have richer universal types, and this also relates to Chris' question. Like uh, sometimes you want to thi push things onto the lexical level and not completely to the dependency label. So what are the things we need to push onto the dip uh, lexical level, and what are the things that we can factor? So we are also doing that work, mm, and the uh, uh, like future goal is to get any target representation directly from the dependency trees without having to go through intermediate logical forms. Okay. So this in this talk, mainly I talked about dependencies to logical forms and how to use those logical forms to do free-based semantic parsing. But the, one of the other areas I'm very excited is about uh, exploiting text for, for free-based semantic parsing, which I won't be talking about today. Um, so if you're interested, you could also see that. So in summary, so like why type semant semantics is important and how to derive type semantics for from dependencies and how to use those logical forms for free-based semantic parsing. You could also try my demo here. So thank you. Should we take yeah, your question? Yeah. Question. <laughs> I don't know if it was just a, a misunderstanding on my part or a typo on the or whatever, but like you have these expressions, it was like lambda z, yeah, blah, yeah. blah, 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 and then there's no z in the expression. There's z, a grounded z e. Yeah, is right, that, right. Is that just supposed to be lambda z e? Is that the, is that yeah, the word yeah. I'm missing? Um, so I'm not going to the details of uh, type system, but we actually have lambda z e and lambda Z A as well. So Z, Z is a paired uh, variable. It's not just one single variable. Okay. Mm. Yeah. So you could assume this as lambda Z E for for simplicity. But so Z E just means the E typed kind of sub part of Z or yeah, something. Yeah. Like right. That. Right. Yeah. I see. So yeah. Z is an untyped variable in some sense. Is that what? Uh, you're Z is actually like paid. It has Z E and Z A inside. Like so, it is typed, but its type is both event and uh, individual. Like so, uh, it's. So what is required? That's what that's is, good what, point. What like a, I could what actually. Is, I mean, some of it doesn't make sense in some way. Required is always an event. It's not a individual. So here you see here. Yeah. Uh, 
so here for acquired so uh, here I have access but it should be Z so so lambda X A X E acquired of X E so I never used X A there because acquired is not an individual whereas for Pixar I had lambda X A X E Pixar of X A and I never used X E there so it's a it's a paired variable because this makes our typed uh, semantics much simpler. Because sometimes we do not know whether the expression we are getting here is an event ex expression or whether it is a, a noun expression. And sometimes we might even need both of them. Like if you say Obama is the president of United States, are you referring to the presidential event in which both of these are participants, Obama and the United States, or whether you are referring to the individual label representing the president. So in that case, would you have president of XE and president of XA? Oh, for president even the XA. Yeah. You would do both yeah. of them? Yeah. yeah. In that sentence, you're saying it is both of them? It, so or there are two things we are referring. Or that there's ambiguity between the two of them? So freebase, so at least like since we are trying to do freebase here, Freebase uh, has both of them. So it, he, for that particular sentence, you, it would have two things, even to uh, variable and also a type variable. Yeah, I, yeah. uh, is the demo doing the uh, freebase parsing or is it doing the uh, logical form conversion? Oh, so it's doing the logical form conversion, uh, but uh, yeah, the code is available. Like I could also provide you the freebase But Was there some way to compare it to other ungrounded logical form like Boxer or things like that? Like, uh -huh. did, did you look at ways to compare? Um, uh, so the only thing I compared was using CCG logical forms. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, I would expect it would be the same yeah. in Boxer because that's derived from CCG. It's CCG, yeah. I see. Yeah, but in the comparison, I was using the freebase. Yeah, yeah. Task. Oh, for freebase task, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. No more. Yeah, I'm here for the rest of the day and also uh, on Monday. I would like to meet some of you. <laughs> I, I, I will send you emails like I will. <laughs> All right, that's, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks.